in the last lecture we had met two distinct and very important players in the theory of scattering these are two different sets of states which are called in and out states respectively a typical in state would be denoted chi alpha plus the plus here indicates that we are talking about an in state and alpha is a composite label which bunches together the labels for all the single particle states which go and make up the system that is alpha is something like p1 sigma 1 n1 p2 sigma 2 n2 and so on where pi sigma i and ni are respectively the four momentum the spin component and the species label for the ith particle note that when we are saying something like this we imply that there is a sense in which this particular state chi alpha plus can be thought of as composed of independent particles which bear these single particle labels in an interacting theory and we are only going to be interested in interacting theories what we mean here is that if we were to observe this system in the infinite past or at least long long time before the particles get close enough to cause interactions observations made on the state would reveal that the particles have these labels that is the first particle will turn out to have four momentum p1 spin component sigma 1 and so on chi alpha minus is defined similarly but for infinite future that is if we were to observe a system in a state chi alpha minus in the limit t goes to infinity that is very far forward in time you would find that it contains particles with the labels given by alpha that is p1 four momentum sigma 1 spin component for the first particle and so on let me try to clarify the, this notion of in and out states a bit further let us focus on this particular part of the label alpha in chi alpha plus for example p1 of course is not one number but a set of four numbers this is after all a four vector and what this suggests is that the state chi alpha plus that we are looking at may be an eigen state of the four momentum operator for the first particle that is a bunch of these four operators and these are just the corresponding eigen values of course something similar can be said about capital p2 capital p3 etc the four momentum operators for the second third particle and so on however note that i mentioned maybe so let us take a look at this a bit more carefully our state chi alpha plus does not evolve in time remember we are working in the heisenberg picture where the states are time independent however the operators do evolve in time so the question as to whether chi alpha plus is say a p11 eigen state and i can see it corresponding to this particular operator with eigen value given by this is actually a time dependent question the p11 operator itself depends on time now what this designation chi alpha plus this in state designation really means is that if you were to check whether chi alpha plus is an eigen state of p11 just as an example at any arbitrary time you will find that the answer is no but in the limit t goes to minus infinity the operator p11 will take a form such that chi alpha plus is an eigen state belonging to the eigen value small p11 
And this goes for all the labels that we are talking about. Now, there is one important operator here, which is slightly distinguished. If you take the sum total of all the zeroth components of the four momenta, what you get is the total four momentums zeroth component. This is nothing but the Hamiltonian capital H for the full system. Now, according to our specification, our Chi alpha plus is of course an eigenstate of capital H in the very distant past corresponding to the eigenvalue P10 plus P20 plus P30 summed up over all the particles. However, the important point about capital H is the following. Operators usually change with time in the Heisenberg picture, but one operator which does not change in time happens to be the Hamiltonian. So, once a capital H eigenstate, always a capital H eigenstate. Here note that when I am saying once, I don't mean that Chi alpha plus is evolving in time. What I really mean is, capital H evolves in time in such a way, in other words, does not evolve at all, so that at all times, whatever capital H is, Chi alpha plus is an eigenfunction of that corresponding to the eigenvalue E alpha. The same, of course, goes for Chi alpha minus. If you were to measure P11, P12, P13 or some other four momentum component or spin component and try to figure out whether Chi alpha minus is an eigenstate or not, the answer would in general be no. However, in the limit T goes to plus infinity, the operators involved will take a, such a form the Chi alpha minus will become an eigenstate of that. Rather than saying will become, we should really say will be, because it's the operators which evolve, not the state itself. So the all-important point I'm trying to make here is, the in-states and out-states are actually eigenstates of the total Hamiltonian. They are not eigenstates of the other relevant operators at all times, but they are eigenstates of what the operators become in the distant past or the distant future in the two cases. Now, as we have discussed the other day, a very important situation which often arises is that capital H, the full Hamiltonian, can be written down as a free particle Hamiltonian H0 plus a perturbation or an interaction term, capital V. The free Hamiltonian H0 has eigenfunctions phi alpha, which are labeled with, with the same set of composite labels for single particles. And the eigenvalue E alpha is actually the same as the one for Chi alpha plus and Chi alpha minus. After all, E alpha is nothing but the sum of P10 plus P20 plus P30 labels, which are there in the Chi alpha plus and Chi alpha minus states. And we had clarified in the previous lecture how is it that despite the perturbation, the Hamiltonian H0 and the total Hamiltonian H ends up having the same energy eigenspectrum? These states phi alpha are of course orthogonal, orthonormal and complete as we have written down in these expressions here. Now we have seen in the last class that we can actually formally write Chi alpha plus and Chi alpha minus as a result of an operator called the Mollar operator, in fact two Mollar operators, omega at minus infinity and omega at plus infinity, acting on phi alpha, where omega is defined to be a tau dependent operator e to the i h tau times e to the minus i h zero tau. The limiting values of these operator valued function at the limiting times minus infinity and plus infinity, respectively, acting on the free particle eigenstate phi alpha will give us our interacting particle in and out states with the same labels, chi alpha plus and chi alpha minus. Now, while this is a perfectly good formal solution to the problem of exactly what the in and out states are, 
And this equation will turn out to be very handy later on. This topic of in and out states is so important that it is quite useful to take a look at another formal way of writing down chi alpha plus minus in terms of phi alpha and the interaction. We are talking of something called the lippmann schwinger equation, which is a central result in scattering theory. And let me emphasize once again, this equation is not only useful in quantum field theory, this is a very useful result in all of quantum mechanics, at least wherever scattering is concerned. In the lippmann schwinger method, what we do is we seek eigenfunctions, chi alpha plus and chi alpha minus, of the full Hamiltonian capital H corresponding to eigenvalue E alpha. And this, of course, is the same as H0 plus V acting on chi alpha plus minus is E alpha chi alpha plus minus. And it's easy to see that you can rewrite this expression in the following manner. Now, if E alpha minus H0 had been an invertible operator, you could have written chi alpha plus minus as E alpha minus H0 inverse acting on V chi alpha plus minus. Now, let me hasten to emphasize that this is not really legitimate because E alpha minus H0 is not an invertible operator. And even if this had been legitimate, this would not have given me a solution to the problem because the unknown quantity chi alpha plus minus is sitting on both sides. However, experience with perturbation theory should have indicated that if we could write something like this, we could perhaps get a good handle over how to handle the problem, this equation that we want to solve for chi alpha plus minus, at least perturbatively, if nothing else. Of course, all that is moot because E alpha minus H0 cannot be inverted. Let me remind you that a basic result in linear algebra is the following. A linear operator can be inverted only if its kernel consists of only the null vector. In other words, if an operator acting on a non-zero vector gives you zero. So that this non-zero vector is a member of the kernel of that operator, then this operator cannot be inverted. It's pretty easy to see why. After all, if an operator capital A could be inverted and if it acted upon a non-zero vector V to give you zero, that is AV where zero, we could have just simply used the inverse to conclude that V equals A inverse acting on 0, which is 0. And that, of course, is a contradiction. Now, in our case, we know that H0 has E alpha as an eigenvalue. So, E alpha minus H0 acting on phi alpha will obviously give me 0. Not only is phi alpha annihilated by E alpha minus H0, a full continuum of free particle states with the same energy as E alpha, but with other single particle labels which differ from those in alpha, they would also be annihilated by E alpha minus H0. Hence, this hope of inverting the operator directly and writing down chi alpha plus minus in terms of V chi alpha plus minus does not seem to work out. On the other hand, if we could somehow tune the value of the perturbation capital V and dial it down to zero, we do expect that the in and the out states would then tend towards the free particle state phi alpha. Now with this in mind, and noting that the reason why E alpha minus H0 cannot be inverted can be alternatively stated as simply the fact that E alpha is an eigenvalue of H0, we can actually write chi alpha plus minus in this form. Note that since phi alpha is killed by E alpha minus H0, 
the presence of this extra phi alpha on the right hand side here does not hurt the chances of chi alpha plus minus satisfying this equation. And the other important thing that we have done is that we have added a tiny positive or negative imaginary piece to this quantity. Now note that since the eigenvalues of H0 are, are all real, they can never be equal to E alpha plus minus I epsilon. And hence, this particular operator that you have here has no zero eigenvalues, so can be inverted. And we have inverted this. Of course, in the end, we have to take the limit as epsilon goes to zero so that we can recover this equation. So both the boundary value, that is, as v goes to zero, we want chi alpha plus minus to go to phi alpha. And this equation is incorporated in the solution, at least in the limit, epsilon goes to zero. The question about the choice of plus or minus sign here is something we are going to deal with soon. All we have done is change the operator in such a way that it does not have any zero eigenvalues and hence can be inverted. Now this V acting on chi alpha plus minus is a vector in our Hilbert space. So according to the completeness of the phi alpha states, we can write that down as an expansion over the phi's. So here we have integral over d beta. Let me remind you once again that in the last lecture we had introduced this notation that an integral over d beta would actually mean integral over all the three momenta involved in the label as well as summing up over all the sigmas and all the n's times phi beta times this particular matrix element or inner product phi beta with v chi alpha plus minus. And because the phi beta are h0 eigenstates, we can make this operator e alpha minus h0 plus minus i epsilon inverse act on phi beta and give you this denominator here. Note that this would have failed if we did not have this plus minus i epsilon term because then one of the e betas would have matched e alpha and this would have blown up. So formally we have been able to write chi alpha plus minus as phi alpha plus an integral term and this is our lippmann schwinger equation. We, chi alpha plus minus is phi alpha plus integral over all the other labels beta integral over continuous variables and sum over the discrete ones of this ratio t plus minus beta alpha by e alpha minus e beta plus minus i epsilon times phi beta where t plus minus beta alpha is nothing but my shorthand for this. For reasons that will be clearer soon, this is called a transition amplitude. But basically this is the inner product of the free particle state with label beta with V acting on either the in or the out state with the labels alpha. Of course, this equation cannot be solved immediately because within these numbers t plus minus beta alpha, you have the unknown chi alpha plus minus stuck here. However, this form should make it pretty obvious that we can handle this problem at least perturbatively. For example, if we expect the v to be very small and hence t plus minus beta alpha to be very small, chi alpha plus minus to the zeroth approximation would simply be phi alpha. In other words, the interaction does not change the state appreciably so that the free particle states with a given label actually match the in and out states, at least to a good approximation. What we can then do is take this as approximation for chi alpha plus minus and use that to calculate an approximate value to, for t plus minus beta alpha as phi beta comma v phi alpha. Plug that back in the equation and calculate the first correction to it. It is pretty easy to see how we can push this further and further. Now that I have hopefully managed to convince you of the fact that the lippmann schwinger equation is a useful tool in the study of scattering processes, let us go back to the fundamental question of exactly what 
dictates this choice of sign of the imaginary part in the denominator here. Let me reiterate that because phi alpha is killed by E alpha minus H0, we can be sure that E alpha minus H0 acting on psi alpha plus or psi alpha minus in the limit of I epsilon going to 0 will actually recover V times psi plus minus alpha. That is the equation that psi plus minus alpha is supposed to satisfy is going to be recovered. It is also a nice thing to remember that in the limit of V vanishing, psi alpha plus minus does go to phi alpha. However, all this would have happened for either sign of the imaginary part in the denominator. So exactly what does this say? And exactly what makes us choose the plus sign here in the denominator? for the in states and the minus sign for the out states. To answer that, let me remind you of exactly how psi alpha plus minus is related to phi alpha. In a sense, we expect psi alpha plus minus and phi alpha to behave similarly to each other in either the distant past or in the distant future. But let me remind you, as we discussed in the last lecture, we cannot say that psi alpha plus minus approaches phi alpha in the limit t goes to minus plus infinity. For the simple reason that we are using the Heisenberg picture and psi alpha plus minus are time independent state vectors. However, as we had discussed earlier, we can take a look at what the state would look like from the point of view of a time translated observer and taking that into account, we could talk about the fact that e to the minus i capital H times tau acting on psi alpha plus minus in the limit of tau going to minus infinity or tau going to plus infinity should be the same or at least should give you the same effect as e to the minus i a0 tau acting on phi alpha in the same limit of course. Once again, as we had mentioned there, these states being capital H and capital H0 eigenstates respectively, the action of e to the minus i capital H tau or e to the minus i capital H0 tau on psi alpha plus minus and phi alpha does not really give us something very useful because all we get are overall phase factors and we cannot really draw physical conclusions from them. What we have to do is deal with superpositions of closely spaced energy eigenstates. In other words, we need to talk about psi g plus minus or correspondingly phi g where all we have done is taken these states, psi alpha plus minus, the in or out states, and superpose them together, weighting the states with a factor g of alpha. And this function is centered around some central energy value and dies off as you move away from the central energy value. So, psi g plus minus and phi g are essentially superpositions or wave packets formed by using the same modulating function g alpha. And what we are claiming here is psi g plus minus t, which is e to the minus i h t and not tau, acting on psi g plus minus, which of course is nothing but this integral. Remember capital H when it acts on psi g plus minus, just gives you E alpha as a factor. So this is exactly what you get. And phi g t, which is e to the minus i h 0 t, acting on phi g, is a similar superposition. Before we go any further, let me hasten to 
clarify what this notation means. We are not saying that phi g of t, for example, is a state vector which is phi g at time t equal to 0 and then evolves in time to become phi g of t in time t. This, of course, depends on the parameter t, but that's basically because you are looking at the state phi g from the point of view of a time translated observer. Let me stress once again. We are using the Heisenberg representation where the wave vectors do not evolve in time. Now, when we say psi plus minus alpha are actually in or out states, what we mean technically is psi g plus of t, the superposition, and psi g minus of t approach phi g of t for t going to minus infinity and t going to plus infinity respectively. What we need to see is exactly whether our choice of plus minus i epsilon in the denominator of the lippmann schroeder equation leads us to this result. To see whether this is true, we look at psi g plus minus t, this particular integral expression here, and replace the psi alpha plus minus by what the lippmann schroeder equation gives us. And this leads to this equation. We have the superposition with the weighting factor g alpha times the time dependent factor e to the minus i e alpha t, which comes from e to the minus i h t, remember. And this, of course, is nothing but psi alpha plus minus according to the lippmann schroeder equation. Now, if you break up this bracket here, the first factor phi alpha gives rise to one integral which is nothing but phi g of t. And the rest gives us this double integral. Once again, this is not really a double integral, it's a high order multiple integral. But formally, this is an integral over a bunch of parameters alpha and another bunch of parameters beta. And this is my integrand for that term. Note that phi beta, of course, does not depend on alpha. So we can somewhat cavalierly think of interchanging the order of integration here and integrate over alpha first, leaving the phi beta out of it. And what we are going to do is we are going to next investigate the behavior of this particular quantity, this integral over all parameters corresponding to the single particle states, p1, sigma1, n1, and so on. This is an integral over all the single particle parameters pertaining to the set of parameters in alpha. Now, in this integration, you are actually going to integrate over all the three momenta of all the particles involved. And we should be able to change variables so that one of the integrations can be done over the total energy E alpha. So that is what we are going to do next. The reason being that this factor E alpha is present both in the form of the exponential here as well as at the denominator. Also, g alpha essentially is a function which is peaked at a central value for E alpha and vanishes once you go very far away from it. But of course, this is a multiple integral and E alpha is only one of the variables over which you are going to integrate. So, one part of this calculation for this i beta plus minus is going to be evaluation of this particular integral. There are, of course, going to be other integrations after this so that we can arrive at the final result. But for the time being, as I said, we will focus on this integral. Now, this integral, of course, is to be done over all allowed possible values of E alpha, which will be from zero all the way up to infinity. However, note that G alpha essentially vanishes when you are far away from some central value. Let's call it E zero. So, this integration really is going to be done between E0 minus delta E to E0 plus delta E for some finite delta E. Beyond that, the integrand vanishes. Because the integrand vanishes beyond that interval, we can easily push this integration limit from 0 to infinity, all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
So we can do it over the entire real line or real E alpha line. Now, an integral like this with a complex function, an exponential thrown in here, done over the entire real line, cries out for, you must have guessed it, contour integration. So what we are going to look at is a situation like this. E alpha, of course, is a real parameter, but we can always think of a complex parameter E alpha and then carry out the integration over a contour on the complex plane. A part of the contour will be a straight line going from minus r to plus r on the real line. And then we are going to close it to form a closed contour by a semicircle, as we always do in most complex analysis problems. For the time being, let us consider the semicircle to be in the upper half plane. So the contour that we are using is basically the curve in red in the picture. Of course, what we want is the integral over the real line from minus infinity to plus infinity. Instead, we are evaluating this contour integral over this semicircular closed contour. You all know the reason behind that. We expect the semicircular part, the curved part of this contour to contribute zero. And that is correct in the limit t goes to minus infinity. To see why that is, note that we have e to the minus i e alpha times t in the integrand. And if my e alpha has a positive imaginary part as it would in the upper half plane, then this gets multiplied by an extra e to the minus i, let's call the imaginary part i times e tilde. And this, of course, is e to the plus e tilde t. In the limit t goes to minus infinity, this will vanish because e tilde, after all, is a positive number. You are in the upper half plane, remember. So as long as e alpha has a finite positive imaginary part, the semicircle will contribute nothing. And so the contour integral will be the same as the integral that we want to evaluate. Now for this, we have to make use of the poles inside the contour. Now where will the poles inside the contour come from? One possibility is the denominator. But if you are using the plus sign here, remember that's the one which corresponds to psi plus alpha, the in state, then the pole actually is at E alpha equals E beta minus I epsilon. So it's just below the real line, just outside our contour. Of course, G alpha or T plus minus beta alpha viewed as functions of a complex value E alpha might very well have poles inside the contour, that is inside the upper half plane. But when we try to calculate the residues for these poles, you have to also evaluate the value of e to the minus i e alpha t there. And because all these poles have positive and finite imaginary parts, the residue here is going to vanish in the limit t goes to minus infinity for the same reason as the one that we talked about a while ago. Now, a pole at e beta plus i epsilon would have contributed to this in the limit epsilon goes to zero. Remember, that would make the pole inside the contour, so it would contribute. And the residue will have a e to the minus i e alpha t with a real e alpha in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And so that will not damp out or exponentially damp out the contribution from this integral. However, if we have chosen the plus sign for the denominator, as we have done for psi plus, what we end up with is none of the poles from G alpha or T plus minus beta alpha contribute. And the only pole from the denominator which could have contributed is actually outside the contour. Hence, this contour integral would actually vanish. Therefore, in the limit t going to minus infinity, 
the additional piece in our lippmann schwinger equation will not contribute anything. In other words, in that limit, psi g plus t will exactly match phi g t. The other term simply vanishing because of the reasons that we have outlined right now. That exactly is what we demand for an in-state. The superposition psi g, when you apply e to the minus i h t on it, will match phi g with e to the minus i h 0 t acting on that. In the limit t goes to minus infinity. And that is exactly what is happening. In the limit t goes to minus infinity, the double integral term just goes to 0. Of course, it would not have gone to zero if I had chosen the other sign, the minus sign, because then you would have ended up with a pole almost immediately above the real axis, in fact, on the real axis, in the limit epsilon goes to zero. And you would have had a contribution from that term. So in the limit t goes to minus infinity, psi g minus t will not go to phi g t. And that clearly tells you that Psi g minus t is not a superposition of in states. We can repeat the argument almost in toto for the case when t goes to plus infinity. There, in order to damp out the contribution from the semicircle, we would need to close the contour in the lower half plane. And then, if you are using the minus sign in the denominator, the pole would be at e beta plus i epsilon, so it would be above the real line, and so outside our contour. And once again, in the limit t goes to plus infinity, we will be able to show the psi g minus of t will approach phi g t. This completes the proof that with the proper prescription for the sign of i epsilon in the denominator, the lippmann schwinger equation actually gives you the in-states or the out-states. We are going to make use of the lippmann schwinger equation in a later lecture where we use it to prove the unitarity of the S matrix. The S matrix or the scattering matrix is going to be the topic of our next lecture. From the name itself, you should be able to gauge that this is a pretty important tool when we deal with scattering theory. In fact, it is going to be one of the most important tools that we use in scattering theory. But that will have to wait for the next lecture. Bye for now.